So I'm Paul Sheehan, executive editor of Gold Derby, and I think I know a little bit about the Tony Awards, but it's nothing compared to these two. David Buchanan, who did the absolute best among the thousands of people predicting the nominations, and Sam Ekman, who came did very, very well too, and both much better than me. So I'm going to turn it over to them and let's all of us steal their predictions. And I think should, let's start on the musical side, David. So talk about the sure things and the long shots. What's so exciting this year is in the top categories, there isn't necessarily a sure thing. Best musical seems to be shaping up like a race between Dear Evan Hansen and Come From Away. Uh, right now I have Dear Evan Hansen out front, but uh, there seems to be a lot of support for Come From Away. And, and when I saw it, it really took me by surprise. I thought it was a fantastic show. So I could see that pulling off an upset. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, you know what, Come From Away, the sort of narrative behind it, uh, offstage narrative, reminds me a little bit of Gentleman's Guide, mm. and how they won, because Come From Away came in and people did not expect it to do well. You know, it was immediately like branded the 9-11 musical, and people were like, why are they bringing this to Broadway? It's never going to sell, it's not going to be commercially viable, but the spirit of it and the message behind it has really resonated with people, and its success has like been entirely based on word of mouth. I think it has better word of mouth than any show on Broadway right now. Um, and that, it, that gives it a really strong rooting factor because it all of a sudden went from this little tiny thing that people thought would fail to a million dollar a week success with sold out houses. Um, and that's, you know, pretty incredible for a show with that kind of subject matter and with no names, uh, you know, star names above the title. So I think it kind of has like, it could upset if it has that, you know, really strong rooting factor. For the yeah, what I, yeah, what's what's interesting about both of them is <clears throat> I could see both of them doing really well with wins in other categories. So I think if we're looking at what other categories they're going to win, they both seem almost equally strong. What about, yeah, it's not a, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, what about Natasha Pierre and the Great Common? I mean, doesn't that have the most nominations? Like at the Oscars, we always think if you've got the most nominations, you're probably gonna win the big award, in this case, Best Musical. Well, tell that to Lincoln. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I think, I think Great Common is going to win several Tonys. It's gonna do well with the design categories. I think it's gonna win at least two of those. I think it's in for, um, in for choreography, but I don't know that it's, I don't know, something just hasn't quite clicked to make it competitive. I don't think it has the same emotional heft maybe as the other two. And in such a tight year, I think just that one little thing is gonna make it fall to third place. Um, I did wanna, it's interesting that many people are predicting it, including myself right now, have Rachel Chavkin, the director. I do too. Winning best, winning best director without you know, that being the best musical. And you'd have to go back to 2006 to find a similar circumstance. I think when John Doyle won for Revival of Sweeney Todd, um, but Pajama Game ended up winning the Revival Award. So that's kind of a dicey prediction. Um, and I've been thinking like if Great Comet is falling uh, to third place, they might end up giving director to Michael Greif because they actually passed over him when he directed Rent, he lost the directing award. And so all these years later, he now has another huge mega hit on his hands. Um, and so I don't know how many voters are aware of that, that he lost all those years ago and have that in their memory. But if they do, then they could be like, well, you know what? I'm going to give this one to him this time around. Yeah. And not only that, but he also directed Warpaint this season, right? Yep. Yes. So uh, I know Warpaint didn't resonate with the Tony nominating committee, but those of the voters who are going to it and know that, um, that might really help his case that he has another musical, the new musical on Broadway this season that's, um, uh, you know, didn't do well in terms of nominations, but a really respectable piece of theater. Yeah, and I mean, it did get four, you know, a lot of people didn't expect it to do anything past the leading ladies, but it also got right. scenic design and costume design. So, and that's also been a big success too. That's, you know, yeah. making a lot of money as well. So, dear Evan Henson, what, what other awards, David, do you think it's going to win? Uh, it's going to win Best Actor. Uh, I know when we talked about uh, post nominations that Andy Carl had a narrative that he could potentially upset, but uh, 
my read of the of the season in the last few weeks is that that kind of momentum has really shifted and and Ben Platt is way out front again. Yeah, the Dear Evan Hansen's kind of campaign machine has been full steam ahead for <laughs> for a yeah. while now, and they've really gotten him out there everywhere. And I think it's just uh, the physicality of the performance and the things he's doing vocally, I think is just going to put him over the edge. Yeah, I think I have so, a winning best score too. Yeah, I have best score. I'm still going with my split thing. For, I think Come From Away is winning best book. Me too. I think those are going to split this year. Because um, I actually don't think Come From Away is going to take as many awards. I think that's one of the few places because Come From Away isn't as big technically and it only has one acting nomination. Book is one of the few places you can definitely reward it. Um, I have Dear Van Hansen winning score and I don't think anything can take that down. Um, I'm curious to see who you have for, do you think Rachel Bay Jones is getting featured actress? I don't know what to do with that still. I, My heart I, is in other places. I have her in first right now, but I'm really tempted to move Jen Colella into, into first place. Just because I, I think the way Come From Away has really emerged as a strong contender this season, if it doesn't win Best Musical, that could be a place where they acknowledge the work of the entire cast outside of book, which I agree. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll win book. Um, so to me, it's the two of them. And then Stephanie Block, maybe as a, as a spoiler, especially since uh, Falsettos did screenings for Tony voters. Um, you know, if they, if they saw the show when it was running and kind of forgot about it and then got to see the screening of it again and remember just how brilliant that performance was, that could be enough to do it. So I'm conflicted as of what to do too. I, I have the three of them really kind of neck and neck. Yeah, it's definitely between the three of them. I'm a complete blockhead. So I'm just like staying <laughs> roll over her a lot. So I have to <laughs> think about what's actually gonna happen. Um, but she, I feel like Stephanie J. Block is the one place they can actually give something to falsettos. Um, Cause yeah. all, they have a revival which they're not gonna win and then all the acting nominations. And I think she's, the one possibility um and uh, i don't know but and it's gonna be close isn't it it's interesting about that featured race because a lot of it has to do with billing and if you're below the title you're automatic you're sort of deemed to be featured because i think stephanie j block's performance really it could credibly be a leading performance i mean she gets lots of songs uh jen colella and come from way she's the only one that has a solo um and then the uh, Rachel from Dear Evan Hansen, if it's going to win Best Musical, could, she could get taken along for the ride. So it's a tough one. And I would say, look on tomorrow, anyone watching this today, look Sunday afternoon, because I think David and Sam will be changing right up to the last <laughs> second. Oh, yeah. Um, no question. But, you know, Probably. But, and, and, and Wing, you know, it's just sort of a slam dunk for Best Actor. I was thinking about him at the Drama League where they give one award out for distinguished performance and there's you know, upwards of 50 people competed and he got it over some real theater veterans. Uh, but I also saw that the Drama League didn't put Bette Midler in the mix. They gave her a special prize. I get to make sure, it seems that only when she's guaranteed for, to win something does she show up because she didn't go get the drama desk. Um, do you, I mean, everyone's saying she's a lock for Best Actress in a Musical, or are you both on that sort of train, saying that there's nobody that can stop her? I think so. I mean, there has been this thing where supposedly she's not performing at the Tony Awards because they could not, um, you know, the producers wanted to stage the title number remotely at, the, at their theater, at the Schubert, and the Tonys declined that because it's, you know, they have to set up a whole new camera crew. They didn't want to set a precedent. Um, so the thing now is that they're supposedly doing David Hyde Pierce doing Penny in My Pocket, which is just one man on stage. Um, and that's, I think that's disappointed a lot of people. So, I mean, maybe there are some folks who said, well, you know, if you're not going to come and perform on the show, then why are we going to give you an award? But I, I just think they're so, you know, I think her closest, Competition is probably Patty Lapone, but she's also competing against her co-star, Christine Ebersol. And some people might prefer Christine Ebersol from War Paint. Um, she has that big solo pink, which is kind of the emotional highlight of the show, I think. So uh, I don't think anyone can really stand in Bette Miller's way, even if she doesn't perform. Yeah, David? I agree. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you just said, Sam. I think 
uh, there is a, a real disappointment and frustration with, for whatever reason, uh, why the producers are not having Bet perform. Um, so, and, and I understand that. Uh, so I could see some voters saying, you know, this is Broadway's biggest night. You're the biggest star of the season. Uh, we need you to draw attention to the event um, and being frustrated that they're not. But there is absolutely no clear alternative um, to go that would have enough support to to um, take to to win. Um, like you said, Patty Patty is is potentially strong, but she has a competitor from her own show in the category uh, and and the other nominees. I just don't think there's a strong enough base of support there that that any of them would overcome bet in the category so uh and you know it, it'll be regardless of if she performs or not that's not what the tony is given for um you know there's certainly a narrative as to why people might be upset about it but um you know what she's doing in the actual theater uh eight shows a week is pretty spectacular so um so she'll she'll be a very deserving winner yeah and then you know, there's potential gavin creel her uh plays uh uh, Cornelius, uh, yeah, he could he could very much win featured actor, right? Oh, I think he's got it in the bag. Honestly, I don't. I, I think, you know, if Falsettos was still running, then maybe Andrew Rannells or Brandon Aranowitz could take it. But I don't think people have a. There doesn't seem to be a clear uniting behind one of those guys. So I don't think. I think they'll cancel each other out. Um, and then there's Lucas Steele from The Great Comet, and he could surge. I just feel like there is, Great Comet is such a huge cast, and you know everyone, all those feature performers, they get sort of like evenly split time, whereas Gavin just kind of takes the stage by storm and gets a lot of screen time. It's a very earnest character that you root for. He's perfect in it, and he's you know, a veteran who's been nominated before, and I think people are finally like, okay, it's your time. You're going to get this one. Yeah. And then, so I think we've sort of gone down the musical list, and really only three musicals are going to win anything, Dear, probably Dear Evan Hansen and uh, Come From Away and Hello, Dolly. On the play side, though, it's sort of everything. When I was doing the roundup of the predictions based on our experts, people like you, our editors, uh, the people that did the best last year, nothing was winning more than two awards. Um, but just So starting with best play, seems to be a bit of a tug of war. Who, who are you predicting, uh, Sam? To what, what are you predicting to win best play, Sam? <sighs> you know, I've had a Doll's House part two all season since I saw it, because um, it blew me away, and it seems so different from everything. Oslo has been winning a lot of the prize. I think it's a really close race, even though I think most of our experts have Oslo right now, because it's won so many of these pre-Tony awards. But this play season has been pretty competitive. And the New York Times just came out with their Tony voters poll that said, you know, basically Oslo and Adult's House Part Two are neck and neck. And even Sweat and Indecent are not that far behind in terms of the people they voted. It's pretty evenly split votes. So I think this is the place where we get something shocking. Um, right now I have sort of Oslo because it's the safest option in my mind. It'll probably change five times before <laughs> tomorrow night. But, um, it seems like the most significant at its core is about international relations. It's about two people from countries that hate each other that say we're going to sit down and actually hash it out and find a way to come together. And I think that's a theme that's really uh, resonating right now in the political climate. So I think that might push it over the edge. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a really hard time making a decision uh, personally, because the two that seem to be out of the conversation were the two that I like the best. <laughs> so um, I loved Indecent. I really liked Sweat. Um, I, and I liked Oslo and, and A Doll's House Part Two as well. It's an incredible, I, I just have to say, it's what an incredible season for plays where if any one of these was competing in a previous year on its own, it would be a shoe in So um, that, that makes it really difficult. I have Oslo out front too, just because it's built a lot of momentum at these precursors, we know that they're not particularly meaningful as as other industry awards like the Oscars um, or the Emmys uh, and their precursors, but it does have uh, the momentum from the past few weeks. Um, what I will say about A Doll's House Part Two is uh, their, their campaigning and their strategy has been incredibly smart in a way that Oslo, not that they haven't um, 
not that what they're doing anything wrong, but uh, Doll's House, I think, is out campaigning them, especially with uh, Scott Rudin behind the production. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that win just because it's, uh, it's really ramped up its, its um, uh, visibility in the last few weeks. And it did, it did incredibly well in the nominations. Um, you know, it got all four of the actors in when some people didn't think that the entire cast would get in. So uh, I think it's really at least a two horse race, um, but I could honestly see any of them winning. And, and doesn't it, I mean, we, we sometimes overemphasize the influence of the road producers uh, and maybe, you know, the 840 votes, but the road producers, I mean, Doll's House, one set, mm -hmm. four actors. That's a show that's going to get produced everywhere. Three hour, 15 or 16 in the cast. I lost count. You yeah. know, uh, that, that's, that's like what regional theater can do show. Oslo, you know. Yeah. Um, and another yeah. thing, Doll's House so, Part um, two but, announced they extended as well. So if you're yeah. voting for that, you're voting for a commercial success versus, you know, this. Uh, thing from a nonprofit that no one can afford. Now, what about the uh, best actress race? If we said Bette Midler's a short thing on the musical side, is there a short thing on the play side? I think it's between two. Um, I've had Laurie Metcalf the whole, the whole time since nominations, and then Laura Linney started picking up momentum. So I don't think that's out of the question, but I still have Metcalf in first, and I think I'm going to stick with her uh, through, the, through Sunday. Yeah, they'd both be really worthy, and I think that's who it's coming down to. I'm going with Metcalf right now just because Laura Linney is fantastic. They're both overdue. They never won Tony's despite being nominated mm -hmm. several times. But Linny's character is like really evil and it's, you know, she's duplicitous and, you know, that's some of the fun of the play. But a lot of times with awards, we see what, when push comes to shove, you kind of need to root for the character a lot in order to win. And she, Regina's kind of hard what, to root for in the end. And, and, the, and the, the uh, conceit of Little Fox is that she and Cynthia Nixon, who's down and featured for playing a much nicer character, Bertie, um, but they switch roles. So do you think that Laura Linney, if she was lucky enough to get some Tony voters who paid to see her in the featured role, because they would have gotten free tickets to see her in the leading role? Yeah, definitely. And I think that'll be on people's mind, too. That's, I think that's another reason why she's very competitive. Even if they don't see her as Bertie and go back a second time, they know that she and Nixon are taking on this like monumental task of basically learning the whole show. And it's not a quick, no intermission, you know, hour and a half show. It's a two and a half hour, three act play. It's a lot of work. Um, so that is definitely a, something in her favor. Um, I just had, I think Metcalf is more of this, I think she elevates the material she's in and it, she's just like this firecracker from the moment she steps on stage and never leaves. But do you, do you think that then he doesn't win that Cynthia Nixon is going to win in featured? Yeah, I, I think Cynthia Nixon's definitely going to win in featured just because um, the other nominees in the category are all competing against a co-star. Um, and we've seen in, in really recent years in Tony history that that often, unless there's a clear favorite of the two or the three, that often leads to somebody else winning. So... Um, and Cynthia Nixon got rave reviews for her performance too. So it, it's, it's not as if they're, you know, the vote is splitting and, and it's just going to somebody else. Um, you know, Cynthia Nixon is beloved in the, in the industry. Um, like you said, Paul, she is performing two roles. So if that's on voters' minds, that really helps. Um, and just of the competition, I don't think there's any one of the other four women who stands out as a clear, again, as a clear alternative. Um, they're, all, they're all excellent. Um, so I could see any one of them getting pieces of support, but uh, Cynthia Nixon, I think, is, is really strong going into Sunday night. But, but Sam, you've got a particular favorite in that category, don't you? Well, I love Jane Howdy Shell. I mean, she, from the moment the place, I think she gets the funniest lines of the whole season of any play. Um, and she's like the moment she stepped out on stage, it was like, oh, cool, you're going to get a Tony nomination yet again. 
um, because she's hysterical. But I, you know, she's also up against her co-star, uh, Condola Rashad, who gets this tight, compact, um, great little scene that she gets to do. So that could split votes. And Jane Howdy Show also just won there. So there might not be this sort of urge to there's other options to go. It's not like she was the only, um, you know, clear front runner there. So I think Nixon gets it. And th now we were saying about there's some conflict on the, the actress side, but it looked like on the, in the acting race, both for lead actor and featured actor, I mean, there's two core things, aren't there, David? In, in which category? Actor? Actor, actor yeah, yeah, actor. on the play side. Oh, yeah, so in, in actor, I think it's, it's pretty clear cut for Kevin Klein. Um, in featured actor, I'm not so sure. I'm really struggling to uh, go with Danny DeVito, who seems to be the clear front runner, but um, I could really see, especially since I don't think Jennifer Ely is winning and I don't think Jefferson Mays is winning, I could see Michael Aronoff upsetting in featured actor. So I, I'm not sure if I'm going to predict that yet because Danny DeVito is so far out front, but I could really see that happening and I'm really concerned about it. Yeah, I've been going back and forth on that because Danny got great reviews, but he's the only nomination from his show. And it's a show that closed, it stayed open, you know, through part of the spring. So it's more recent, but it was also very under the radar. It didn't perform well with the nominations. And there are two other people, I think Michael Aronov, um, is fantastic and the type of role that usually wins this. He's not maybe as well known as Danny DeVito. And then there's John Douglas Thompson from Jitney. Yeah. And Jitney is most likely going to, it looks like it's going to win a revival anyway. And that's the only, because it was, again, one of those casts that's all in feature. He's the only person nominated from it. So, you know, if you think, you know, how, if those are the two front runners, if Oslo is front runner to win best play, if Jitney has all the support for revival, um, it's like, wouldn't those be more likely to win versus Danny as the only nominee from his show? So I'm having a hard time with that one. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point about John Douglas Thompson, Sam, because out of the five, he would be my personal favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would it, say he has tremendous support in the industry. Actors yeah, look up to yeah. him a lot. So. Yeah, so I, oh man. That now I'm now I'm even more conflicted than I was before. I could I mean I could honestly see any any of the three of those winning. Yeah, I think that's the category where the, there's going to be a big upset. People are going to assume that Danny yeah. has it all along because of all these consecutive wins, but something crazy happens. Yeah, and then the the, the three uh, toughies, the kind of the equivalent of the shorts at the Oscars are the design categories. So um, so over on the musical side everyone that the odds seem to be favoring Hello Dolly for costumes. Um, do you guys agree with that? I think that's going to be pretty close between Hello Dolly and The Great Comet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I currently have Hello Dolly just because the costumes are so vibrant and colorful and incredible. They're almost distracting from the show. Um, but it, that could go either way. I do think Great Comet's probably going to take the other two. So it depends on if they're just going to check yeah. that down the line or if they're going to throw Dolly costumes. Yeah, I agree. And then what about on the play side? <sighs> That's split. Um, though, there's another solo nominee in there. That's uh, it, the play that goes wrong, um, which is up for scenic design, which I currently have predicted for scenic design. But then again, it's the only That's nominee. Right. <laughs> so. Um, it's kind of a, I guess, a risky proposition. Jitney could also, you know, if that's, again, a front runner for revival, they might try to throw at something. Um, but, but the, and the reason is because the set really is the star of the show, right? The set, the play yeah. goes wrong and the set goes dreadfully wrong. I the mean, set it just kind of comes apart. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's great. It's a very deserving winner, but it's just, it always gives you pause to kind of select that as the winner when it didn't find support anywhere else, you know. And yeah, what about um, on the one thing you liked, David, though, that, um, yeah. that we both liked, Indecent, I think is pretty much a shoe in for lighting design. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. That's what I have out front now. And something that struck me, I think director of a play is really up in the air. Um, 
I think it's kind of a three-way race actually between Rebecca Teichman for Indecent and Bart Schur for uh, Oslo and uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson for Jitney. And so I was kind of thinking like, Indecent's gonna win Lion Design. If that's the only new play, it looks like that's gonna win a design award. If it also sneaks her in for director, uh, I think she just won, she won the Drama Desk, I think, um, or one of them. I think she won the Drama Desk for directing. And so if Indecent has now won two out of its three nominations, mm. does it somehow take best play away from Oslo or Doll's House too? Because it doesn't seem like any other new plays, but the other new plays could potentially get shut out altogether. Yeah, yeah. For, for play director, I, I think I'm going to go out on a limb and predict. I mean, it, he's, he's in the conversation, so it's, it's not that, that daring, but I think almost everybody's predicting Bartlett share for Oslo, but um, I think it's going to be Hudson for Jitney. I really, I do too. I, yeah, I've, I just, I just get the sense that, I mean, number one, it's something we've seen in recent years that what, what the, the show that's winning revival is quite often picking up direction and he's considered to be in kind of this banner year for August Wilson's works. He's considered to be one of the greatest interpreters of, of Wilson's works working today. Um, so I could absolutely see that happening. Um, uh, and then, yeah. yeah, just now we talked all about all the different categories. Uh, what's your prediction in terms of how Kevin Spacey is going to do as host? <laughs> I think we're going to see live impersonations. Um, <laughs> It's going to be different because he's not like, a, he, he can sing, so they might have him sing something, but he's not this big song and dance, you know, Hugh Jackman is, or uh, Neil Patrick Harris, or even uh, James Corden. But I think he'll be charming and fun. It'll just be, a, I'm curious to see what they'll do with him. Yeah, me too. I, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is he has strong roots in the theater and he clearly loves the theater. So I think that will really come out in, in the way that he hosts the show. But like you said, Sam, I don't know how exactly they'll utilize him in terms of if they're going to have him doing numbers or, or if he's just going to come out and introduce the presenters. Um, so that'll be interesting, but I think he'll surprise us in the sense that they've, they, he's, he's been teasing a lot that, you know, he was 15th on the list to host. Um, so, so I think that he'll, um, you know, I think it'll overall uh, be a pleasant surprise, I hope. Well, we'll see tomorrow night and we'll see how the two of you do with your predictions. So I'll be certainly keeping an eye on them right up until the Prediction Center closes probably about an hour before the Tonys. We'll be changing them until then. Great. Yeah. <laughs>